Hey guys. So I hear you had like a really good day and that you're all doing a lot of stuff with software, but all about security, is that correct? Okay, no, all right, that's a basically no, it's not correct, that's fine, that's cool. Hey, so um, let's start the day with a little puzzle. Uh, who is this guy, anybody know? Any physics people here? Google image search? I don't know. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. So this is Ettore Majorana. He's probably one of the most brilliant physicists that ever existed, but it, his whole life and everything he did is a little bit of a mystery because he was like the, the favorite child of Fermi. He was a disciple of Fermi, and he mysteriously disappeared around his 30th birthday. No one knows what happened to Ettore Majorana. And in fact, he still casts a very long shadow on everything around quantum mechanics and physics because we're still looking for, or we're not really still looking for it, but we're still looking at how the Majorana particle uh, is going to affect topological quantum computing. So it's very exciting work that he did a very long time ago that has a huge impact on work that's being done today. But um, it, it's just a bonus question. It's like my icebreaker thing. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is about privacy, security, and how quantum is going to change the way that we think about it. And the reason that KPN, so I, I'm a CISO, I'm a Chief Information Security Officer of a telco here in the Netherlands, it's the incumbent provider, it's kind of like AT&T or BT or Swisscom, you know, pick one of your flavored flavors, and that's what we do for the Netherlands. And the reason that we're interested in it is because we have long-term requirements very long term, like we're looking at, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 year requirements for privacy and security. And my contention is that we have no idea how to build that in. You don't know, but neither do the hardware developers, neither do the rest of the industry working in security who's actually dealing with this problem on a daily basis. And so let's talk about the problem for a moment. Why do we actually need to worry about it and why would we need to build it in? So we're gonna talk a bit about surveillance. We're gonna look at you know, how this impact is done by quantum computing, uh, what it, everyone is doing around it and what we are gonna do about it as a result of that. So what our strategy should be. I'm not just gonna present you a problem, I'm gonna look at a way going forward. So kind of to start it all, uh, the threat is very simple. Intelligence agencies ha have, right now, at this moment, complete information awareness. They know everything there is to know about us. They know where we are, they know who we talk to, and they know how we congregate with the individuals that we do communicate with. So really, despite this complete information awareness, they still worry. And what they're worried about is that the eye of Sauron-like capability that they possess, to see everything all the time is actually stopped by cryptography. They refer to it as the going dark problem because there are areas that they cannot penetrate with that all-seeing eye. And cryptography becomes a huge challenge for them. And you know, even though we all know the extent to which they're capable of, it was revealed through the Snowden papers, there's no massive outcry, there's no public demand for privacy and security. Let me just ask you, how many of you changed your behavior after the Snowden documents? That's not enough hands. There's maybe like about 5% of you that actually put your hand up now. But the clue is, are we willing to change our behavior and are we willing to pay for solutions of other people that have the effect of actually giving us tools to do that for ourselves? And my contention is that we don't. And, and it's because of a lack of public or form opinion, but I think the clue is, um, there's a great um, John, there's a comedian, John, I want to say John, Her what? John Oliver, thank you, the John Oliver, okay, this guy knows, you need to go to him. Just Google John Oliver video, because when it comes to informed public, the only thing they care about is when their dick pics become revealed and are looked at by the NSA or CIA. With the exception of the dick pics, and this is not a colloquial term, uh, with the exception of that, they really seem to think that everything else that's looked at by the intelligence agencies must be warranted, because clearly we're trying to stop pedophiles and terrorists, etc. 
Um, so what you actually see is that we have a renewal because of this lack of opinion and lack of clue amongst the industry to change the way that we look at the problem, we have a renewal of the original crypto wars. How many people remember the original crypto wars? It's an age test. None of you remember. Uh, this is a bad thing because this was a, a thing that happened in the 90s we're going to talk about in a minute. But we basically thought we won a war and it started all over again. And what we saw with the Snowden documents is there's two specific programs that fall under a category called the black budget. The black budget means that the NSA has money allocated to them which they do not have to reveal. They don't have to reveal to Congress how they're going to spend it. And these two areas are called penetrating hard targets, where they actually look at how they're going to break cryptography and specifically start investing in building a quantum computer. And the second one is called owning the net, where they're actually looking for, okay, I've got a hard target. I've got this area where they have good security. I can't get in. Think of Stuxnet. I can't get in, so now I need to find another way, a sort of side channel attack, where I will get in. And you know, because they're exploiting the underlying networks and the underlying systems, the underlying architecture, they actually usually win. So if we take a look again about the original crypto wars, it was basically a question of what do we do with cryptography? Do we ban it or do we just cripple it a little? Do we just make it so weak that it's actually not effective when used and called for by the people who need it the most? So it started by this guy named Louis Free. And Louis Free has an impressive CV. He wrote a book about it, about the stuff he did when he was the director of the FBI. And he brought down the mafia. He investigated Bill Clinton. Some of you may remember that famous blue dress with the stain on it. Uh, and this is a joke. We are a lot, I'm, I'm making really horrible jokes, but it, it's OK. Um, he inv investigated Bill Clinton, and he fought the war on terror. This is a pretty impressive CV for anyone, much less the director of the FBI. And you guys all know who this is? Who's this? Comey. All right, very good. Have you had a long day? Have you been really tired? Are we? OK. So James Comey, and this is Theresa May, who just wants to kind of temporarily get rid of human rights because, hey, that's so handy. You know, let's not do that for now. We'll figure it out later. And this is the EU. The clue is that in France as well, they're very much thinking about how do we weaken cryptography in order to further the capability of law enforcement. And what they're talking about is doing something that they say, it's not a back door. I don't want a back door. I want a court process, judge mandated front door. Technically speaking, there's no difference. If you remember what happened with the FBI iPhone case, there is no difference. They're just calling it something else so it's easier for them to use and get it allowable by the public domain. What they also want to do is do something called uh, golden key management. So imagine that you have one of two scenarios. One, you have a supreme golden key, which always allows you to unlock the crypto, which means you basically weaken the crypto and you allow a sort of master key that's then given to the law enforcement agencies that's put in a sort of escrow, and then you mandate how that escrow process works. That's one way. The other way is called split key management, where you actually break up the cryptographic key, you entrust different bits of the key to different people within a government, and then together they can unlock the same crypto that was used. When Apple or Google or Facebook or WhatsApp would do this for a single country, they would have to do it for all the others as well. So you're basically opening the door to have 100 and different, 160 different potentially, split golden key-like solutions. It would require a flawless technical implementation and a perfect process execution. How many of you would trust your government with either one? <laughs> All right, the dude that raised their hand, we need to talk. So, so you get where, where I'm going. This requires a certain amount of unicorns, you know, I believe in daisies and unicorns pooping out of their butt. Uh, it requires magical thinking. And it's something that's not very likely to happen in any near future that I can envision when it comes to this kind of stuff. But we're also not seeing you know, what the governments really like to do, which is an overhaul of intelligence regulation. If you saw what happened you know, in the UK when the Snowden Papers came out and people were really upset and lawmakers had to do something. So they put together this investigatory powers tribunal to look for abuse of power. And this is unheard of, but in the UK, before Theresa May, they said, you know what? 
there has been seven years of illegality going on. So actually, all this time, when you were cooperating between the GCHQ and the NSA, it was illegal. But it did not prevent the draft communications bill, or RIPA, who was, which was actually the baby of Theresa May, from passing. So it actually passed. So they said, on the one hand, it's horrible, it's terrible, it's illegal, and then Theresa May's bill passed. It's just a little schizophrenic. What also happens is that we see a massive movement for going from a place where we used to come from, from passive interception, so the traffic and the data will be free. We just monitor whatever it is, and we just look at whatever traffic was actually passed to, no, Al-Qaeda was not actually sending their mail, so there was no actual traffic or communications that happened. They left their communications in the drafts folder. So by monitoring the data connection, we don't see it. So we need active interceptions. That means getting into the software, into the platform, like changing the operating system. That's what we're talking about. So actively being on the server and requiring full intercept capability there is a very different ballgame. It would mean that you would have to 100% require the complete cooperation of the technology companies that build these platforms in the first place. There's nothing passive about it. So imagine that you, every once in a while, had a guy named Dave, who was like a sort of narc, working for the law enforcement agency that would just be looking at everything your company ever did. But, you know, sitting next to you and having coffee every once in a while. That's what we're talking about. There's also the U.S. Freedom Act, which was, you know, a revisal of, of the Patriot Act, and it passed. It was very weak, but it basically tried to reinstate some of the protection that's being gone. You know, and since then, it's been trumped. I don't know what else to tell you. Um, it's, a, it's a source of continual embarrassment where I feel like I have to apologize for being an American. So, the, in the Netherlands, we have something called the Wet op de Inlichting en Veiligheidsdiensten, which is in a draft form, which allows for intelligence agencies to have greater expansion of powers. So previously, intelligence agencies, you know, all foreign communications, anything that's over the air, every country treats it the same, which is that it's up for grabs. But national or domestic communication, they have to specify how they get it. So you have this idea of something that's, you know, able to be tapped directly on the cable, and then not able to be tapped. And here, what you see, it's an expansion of powers to get everything all the time. So this is a sort of international movement that's not going to be stopped. No matter what you do, SIGINT agencies, or signal intelligence agencies, are always going to want signal, which is why you should get some too. So when you look at service providers and you look at um, how uh, telcos handle the problem, the way that we look at it is that we're pretty much put in a, plant, in a pretzel, which is like a weird shape. Um, there's this global phenomenon of nationalism. It started actually in China where they said, we're not going to use any products unless they're Chinese. We're actually going to stop you know, the free flow of foreign um, software and hardware. But it also comes down to how do we organize uh, our network communications. So part of the problem means that countries want to actually pull themselves off of the rest of the internet. Y you might have seen this before with what Egypt did, but this idea of creating national splinter nets in order to prevent foreign signal intelligence agencies from getting onto your national networks, this is a real problem for service providers. There's also this notion of hacking back. How many of you know about, in your country or geography, have hacking back legislation? No? Oh. Because here's when it comes interesting. Police agencies, as well as intelligence agencies, are slowly getting an expansion creep of powers where they can hack both domestically as well as abroad to anywhere that they suspect of being a cybercrime. So imagine the impact to you, your company, or your customers when, for whatever reason, you become involved or extricated, sometimes incorrectly, in one of these cases, and there is going to be hacking on your products, services, or customer networks. This is a real issue that we actually worry about because it means that we are going to have fundamental problems guaranteeing continuity of any of those services. And the way that I look at it, it's a three musket musketeers principle. You know, we're doing all of this crazy work for one target, 
And it's, you know, usually comes out to the form of creating a zero day. And it says one zero day for us all. You all saw WannaCry. I'm not going to tell you about WannaCry anymore. But know that this is actually what we worried about, which is this trickle-down effect of vulnerabilities. If you remember the story, I'll just refresh everyone's memory. The NSA, in order to hack hard targets, needs to develop zero days. Because sometimes those targets have their security in order. They've patched everything, they've isolated, they've compartmentalized, they've used encryption. So you can't just get in using the usual channels because they've missed something. They haven't missed anything. So if they have their security in order, you've got to find a vulnerability that is not previously known and exploited and potentially already patched by the vendor. So they have to build zero days. In the creation of the zero days that led to the Shatter Brokers attack, the NSA had outsourced the creation of their zero days to the equation group. The equation group, unfortunately, did not have their security on order, got hacked by the Shatter Brokers. Shatter Brokers was really smart and said, we're going to put it online in an online auction. Bidding starts at 10 million. By the way, I don't know what business you're in, but this is a good business. So, it, you know, bidding starts at 10 million and go ahead and start go ahead and start paying. But they were clearly trolling us all because, you know, regardless of who paid the 10 million, they put the vulnerabilities out on the street anyway. And one of those examples was when they released Eternal Blue uh, and Double Pulsar, which was Windows 1710, um, and that resulted in WannaCry. Is everybody still with me? Do you guys know this stuff already? Yeah? Some of you? OK, good. So this trickle-down effect of vulnerabilities means that it starts with the intelligence agencies, but eventually it winds itself in the hands of script kitties. And we're just going to see that impact every time. And it's just a question of when we follow through with the Cisco, Juniper, and other vendor vulnerabilities that the NSA is also looking to create zero days for. OK, so now what's all this quantum stuff about? Well. I need you to know, because I need you to understand that it's new and it's going to impact us all because of the fact of, you know, when we think about quantum mechanics, this is hard stuff. Has everybody already had their coffee? Are we good? So, you know, classical physics is everything that happened before 1900, pretty much. You know, big stuff. Uh, I can predict what's going to happen because if I do something here, this will be the result. We understand it. It's intuitive. We, we follow through. When it comes to quantum mechanics and quantum physics, it's a little bit different. The birth of quantum mechanics is really kind of considered the 1928 Solvay conference, where Einstein and Bohr had a heated conversation about what happened and the effects of the microscopic world, uh, because they didn't actually know what would happen, because it's highly probabilistic. If you do something here, there's a probability that something might happen like this, or something else might happen, and there's a probability of that too. There's a very strong central role of the observer, and it's anything except intuitive. In fact, Niles Bohr used to say, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, then you haven't understood it yet. I find this really irritating when people say stuff like this. But other than that, the clue is, for us it's relevant because we want to know when will there be a post-quantum era, and that's an era when we have a quantum computer. So after a quantum computer, we're in the post-quantum era. Why is that important? Well, quantum computers have very interesting properties. In a regular computer, we talk about bits, you know, a zero or a one. And when we look at a stream of bits, it can be a zero or a one. Yeah, we see long streams of that. When we talk about quantum computing, we talk about a qubit, which is a zero and a one. So in the same place where you had a zero or a one, you now have a zero and a one. Um, this is already interesting because you're like, ah, oh, I have more stuff in the same place. Good, right? But it becomes really interesting when we look at this property called entanglement. Entanglement is when we take two qubits and we put them in such a relationship that affecting the one affects the other, regardless of the distance between them. Entanglement is what gives a quantum computer scale because in the place where we had a zero or a one, we now have, if we have two qubits that are entangled, a zero and a one, and a zero and a one. If we have four qubits that are entangled, we have a zero and a one, a zero and a one, a zero and a one, a zero and a one. So you see where I'm going here. We're going from a place where you had a linear expansion of capability to a place where it's exponential. It's not quadratic, it's exponential. So you're doing that hockey stick of coolness. I don't know what the it's a technical term. So. 
when we try to explain entanglement, uh, it becomes difficult because Einstein didn't like entanglement at all. First of all, this idea, this notion of connecting things, you know, across vast distances, potentially across the universe, that was pretty groovy to him, and uh, he didn't buy it. In fact, he called it spooky action at a distance. So he didn't believe that it was even possible. But we've proven in about a year and a half ago uh, at the TU Delft that it is possible. There's an article in Nature that you can read, and it's all about the loophole-free bell test. Why is it loophole-free? Because every single test of Bell's inequality before that had loopholes in it to kind of explain what was going on in the experiment. But this one was loophole-free, which means in a distance of four kilometers on campus of TU Delft, we could prove entanglement. But if you take those four kilometers and you make it four million kilometers, it would still work, theoretically, if we could get to four million kilometers apart. Is this blowing your mind? If it's not, get more coffee. <laughs> the other properties of a quantum computer are fragility and no cloning. And this is really, really relevant to all of the stuff we're talking about, about passive interception and active interception. Because the understanding fragility and non-cloning will make you understand why this is so relevant. When you try to observe a particle, you change it. If there is an introduction of any type of observation, there is such noise or instability that you actually collapse the quantum state. Because they're finicky these qubits and these photons. They don't like that. Um, it means that it's impossible for you to copy or eavesdrop in a quantum computer, which we can, of course, do with all regular classical computers. This is no longer possible. But you should know there's more than one type of quantum computer. The type of computer that we're like looking at now, the ones that are the most out there, you might have heard of a company uh, from Canada called D-Wave. They're working on the annealer, the quantum annealer, which is really like not that difficult to do. It's uh, w working, and there's a lot of uh, physicists who also say this is not a real quantum computer, but you know, that being said, it's an annealer. What we're probably going to get in the near to midterm is something called an analog quantum computer, which is using both properties of what we regularly have. You know, there's going to probably be a supercomputer next to the quantum computer doing all kinds of error correction. But the holy grail, or the Google Grand Challenge, or whatever you want to call it, that's the universal quantum computer. And this is what everyone is kind of doing a sort of race to get to first. This is the thing that's going to present a real challenge for us in security, but also going to change the world in so many ways. It's, it's going to be quite phenomenal for the whole scientific uh, industry. Because what it all means is, is this. We all know about Moore's law. You know, we have a doubling of our computing power roughly every 18 months. But there's also the introduction now of Amdahl's law, which is we can keep adding processors, but we won't keep seeing a linear increase. We're actually going to see it slope off and downwards. So because of Amdahl's law, we have an inherent need to find different ways to keep having this fun effect, which we really enjoy, of Moore's. So the way to get there is going to be through quantum computing. And what's really funky is that you know we've already thought about what we're going to do if we had one. Because there's already algorithms that are existing already now, Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm, that have been built before we ever had a quantum computer, just waiting for it to happen. OK, and now I need to explain a little bit of crypto, and I need a victim from the audience. Who's going to volunteer? Come on. OK, I just saw you poke this guy. Because he poked you, it's your fault. Uh, yeah, so it's really difficult. Can you come up here? Yeah, sure. All right. Hello, welcome. All right, really, really difficult question. Ready? Yeah, sure. What's seven times eight? Uh, oh, come on, dude. 48. Not really. 56. OK, you have to go back down right now. Because <laughs> you're ruining my experiment. Is there anyone that can multiply? All right, C can you, yeah, in front of people, it's, I know, right? I, dude, I, I feel you. Yeah, all right. Okay, you can multiply? Yes. Nice to meet you, my name is Jaya. Niha. All right, Niha, what is, uh, let's think of a hard one. Um, 
Okay, Neha, let's talk about what's nine times six? 54. Okay, Neha, what are all the factors of 54? Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Wait, no, this. no, you've helped me. No, this is it. Yeah. Uh, two? No, okay, that's good. That's very good. Thank you, Neha, that was it. That, you did really great. That was it. That w Thanks, Neha. But I should have called on Neha first. Thanks, Neha. But the reason is this. Computers behave just like Neha. Our computers today can multiply problems really well and really quickly. But when we ask those same computers how to do it the other way, like, OK, look, I asked you what is 9 times 6, OK? So we have number 9, the number 6, and we have a result out of that, which is, oh, come on, guys. Do, how many beers did you have? 54, thank you. But then when I ask you to reverse this, I, I give you a result, 54, and now I say, OK, tell me all the possible numbers that could have got you there. And then we find it hard, but so do regular computers, because the way that we do cryptography now, it's basically called um, integers, integer factorization. We find it a difficult problem to solve. And that's why cryptography is based on, at least the asymmetric public key cryptography, is based on multiplying very large prime numbers. So you place the 7 with a really large prime number, and you replace the, oh, what did I say, 9 and 6, you replace that with a very large prime number, your result is the resulting ciphertext. And what you want to now is go back, you want to find your way back to the plain text. Okay? And a quantum computer, this is what it's good at. It's going to try all the possibilities, because that's what it brings with its computing power, and we've got an <laughs> algorithm, thank you, sure, that can already do integer factorization. The other problem that we want to solve is a discrete log problem. And it's the same way as what we just did now with, with this integer factorization problem, except what we're doing is we're raising a number by an exponent. And we're trying to reverse what the exponent was if we have the result. OK? Here's the clue. The basis, the underlying basis for all of this is called a one-way function. It's easier to do one way than the other. Quantum computers happen to be really good at reversing these one-way functions. So that's not the only thing they're really good at. They're good at a whole bunch of other stuff. They're good at protein folding, which means that we're going to find better ways to cure cancer, because right now we've got a 2% rate of, of curing someone when they have cancer with chemotherapy, 2%. That's our success rate of curing people with chemotherapy. That sucks. That's a really bad business case, but we do it every day. But a quantum computer could help us have better drug treatments to cure cancer. We could do protein folding and amino acid predictions. We could do all kinds of different scientific modeling, nitrogen fixing. I mean, there's lots of really cool other stuff we could do. So it would be terrible to not develop a quantum computer because we're afraid of the crypto losses. And you should know that everybody on the whole planet is doing this. Microsoft has their own quantum computing facility. Google's got their bets on two different types of quantum computers. You know, uh, everyone, really everyone, universities, academic institutions, they're all, IBM, they're all in on this. So in the EU, because we realize that this is going to be a huge game changer for the future, and it will really put us in a very negative position for not participating and trying to take the forefront, there is a billion euro project called the EU flagship. I'm actually in that flagship in the high level steering committee that determines how to spend the money. I'm really good at that. So that one billion is going to go to a subsection of industry and academia, and it's going to be there to actually help the EU maintain a position when it comes to figuring out what to do with all this quantum technology. Here's the deal though. Even when we have a quantum computer, right now, a lot of the efforts are also trying to figure out how do we talk to it? What's the software it needs? It has a completely different topology than a regular computer. So part of that money goes to figuring out, it's called QSoft, quantum software. How to have software, it's a whole new field. How to have software that is actually correct to be able to handle all these quantum transactions, to make it possible to do that protein folding. And it's really exciting. I'm just saying. So are we there yet? Not by a long shot. Um, 
because we, we don't have a viable quantum computer with the amount of qubits that you would need to actually break the crypto. Because the bigger the, the cryptographic key that we're using, the more qubits you need to actually be able to go against it. We're talking about a system that requires thousands and thousands of qubits for it to be viable against all these attacks that we're dreaming about. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, we've got three simple steps. If you use crypto now, make sure that your key length is as big as possible, as big as allowable by the protocol specification of the crypto that you're using. Size matters. So key length is really, really important here. The second option is basically to look when you have a network topology for places where you would actually need something called quantum key distribution. Remember I told you we're gonna look for eavesdropping? Well, we're gonna look for that on our network in very specific links. The third thing is to actually say, all right, the quantum computer is going to break our cryptographic algorithms as we have them today. So let's come up with a new set of algorithms. And that's called post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. And there's an entire effort around PQ crypto. So the key length thing is not just my advice to you. It's the NSA's advice to all of their subcontractors. They've actually published this in the Sweet B recommendations for how to handle cryptography. As developers, you probably have to do this quite a bit. You have to integrate uh, crypto considerations. So actually doing this and doing this well will define how well equipped we are when it comes to the initial startups that have a quantum computer. Because in order for them to be truly viable, they've got to get past this first. They've got to have enough sizability and viability to get past this key length issue. The second thing is that quantum key distribution. So how does it work, right? We've got Alice. Alice wants to talk to Bob, but there's just a really annoying Eve. So the quantum channel that she's, Alice is gonna use to Bob is gonna be a fiber channel. So she's gotta have dedicated fiber to talk to Bob because she needs that because otherwise she can't set up this quantum channel. How many of you have dedicated fiber between every, you know, you and every Bob you wanna talk to? I'm a telco. <laughs> So you get the idea, this is not that easy to do. Let's take a look at how it really works though. So when Alice wants to talk to Bob, she's gonna have a photon source, which is also called a single photon emitter. It's gonna get literally a single photon out. She's gonna tell Bob how she set up her diagonal polarizers and her horizontal polar and vertical polarizers. Bob's gonna set it so that whatever Alice is sending, Bob can receive, yeah? And what they're gonna do is, if what Alice sent has been screwed over by Eve. You know, when Bob looks at it and Bob's missing stuff, then you know that this link isn't clean, that you can't use it to share keys, much less have communications. This is just looking for Eve. That's it. So you can't use it everywhere. You can't use it all over the internet because you don't have these dedicated fiber channels because their maximum distance of fiber is also only 64 kilometers. So even if you did have your own fiber factory, uh, 64 kilometers is a bummer. So, Paolo Villerese from the University of Genoa figured out, well, why don't we just do it over free space? So he did a project between two islands in the Canary Islands, which is also a good way to spend your summer. Um, and he had a distance of 144 kilometers where he had two observatories and he could basically shine a laser, fun with lasers. He could shine a laser between the two observatories to get a link going at 144 kilometers. So he had a full, secure quantum channel between two islands. Not bad. All we need is an underground volcano and we're in business. <laughs> so it's, it's actually really cool, but it has massive implications. Because think about it. You know, these two islands are separated by water. There's water vapor, there's all this evaporation. There should be tons of signal loss and issues getting that clear signal across, but there wasn't. Because the Chinese figured this out better than all the rest of us. And what they did is unprecedented in the world. What they're building is amazing. So between Beijing and Shanghai, they're building a 2,000 kilometer network that is fully quantum secure. No one can read this communication across these cities, even with a quantum computer. They're secure. What they've also done, though, that's pretty cool, they've launched their own satellite. 
It's the world's first quantum communication satellite. And the thing about the satellite is, it can also communicate to equipment on the back of a tank. Gets more interesting though. So this slide, it's not my slide, I didn't make it. This is actually from uh, the EU uh, thing on, on quantum that we had last year for the flagship launching and everything. And this is actually from the guy who's building this quantum backbone in China. Uh, they say that they need it in the event of a regional war. They want to have a fully secure communications network. What do you think? This is a very big international effort. They are the only ones that will be able to have not just signals intelligence, but information assurance. And the majority of intelligence agencies, they also have that dual role, right? Keep your secret secret, information assurance, while making sure you get everybody else's secrets, signals intelligence. And the Chinese actually have the balance leaning towards the information assurance way more than the signant. Although that's not bad either. They also have the biggest budget there is for quantum technologies, and they've written it down in their five-year plan, but they are the company, or company, the country that publishes the least amount of research. So the most money, but the least public information. So, uh, the third thing that we need to figure out how to do, other than quantum key distribution across free space or satellites or whatever, is this new set of algorithms, PQ Crypto. And there's an entire organization that's been set up around it. It's uh, done by uh, Tanya Lange and Dan Bernstein, who you may know. Um, that it's like very much true that for a very long time, we've actually had algorithms that can already do this. Um, Lattice-based cryptography already provides a certain amount of hardness against these type of attacks. And the example that we have in the wild for ages is called Mechalese. And it's been there, it's been NP hard since 1978. Um, the British government tried to create their own crypto, their own post-quantum algorithm. This is a bad idea. So I just want to urge you, for any of you that think, ah, oh, there's a huge problem, I know what I'll do, I'll make my own algorithm. Don't do it. Because when the British government did it, they designed their own algorithm, just Google it, okay, CESG and soliloquy, it actually was majorly hackable. So there is no security and obscurity. The only way to get a good algorithm is to let it be peer reviewed. Nixt actually has a call for papers now and a call for algorithms and they're doing candidate selection now for post quantum algorithms. That one of the most likely candidates looks like it's gonna be SIDH or super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman. The problem is that in the cryptographic community there's not a lot of people that understand isogenies. So, uh, it's probably the best thing that we've got going for us, and there's even an algorithm called a new hope. But you should remember that even though... <laughs> I thought that was really cool. Um, but you should remember that even though all of this is happening and you're like, you know what, I'll see it when it happens, and when it's there, I'll figure out how to use it, I need to urge you against that side of thinking. I need to ask you to actually think this problem differently. Think about the fact that everything you have ever sent or ever used or someone has done on your behalf or stored on your behalf or encrypted on your behalf, including local government agencies or the tax authorities or any information that has that long-term privacy and secrecy requirement, that that's up for grabs right now. And without doing something about it, it's already gone because in the Utah data center of the NSA, they have been making outright copies of all of the electronic transmission that is considered foreign communications and they've been holding it because their philosophy is to capture it now and decrypt it later. Because old secrets are often just as good as new secrets. And they have a certain amount of predictive capability over what you're gonna do with even newer secrets. So if it's all up for grabs, rethink this issue. We needed to have started a long time ago, but we shouldn't wait to start later. We should start now. One of the things that we did at KPN, we built one link, one, one link between The Hague and Rotterdam. It's not nearly enough, but we just got started. And that's really where I want to go back to in conclusion. This is just the beginning. It's far from the end. You know, all these projects are happening, but IBM, uh, on their, they have something which I think is really cool, and all of you can go out and get accounts now. They have a publicly accessible quantum computer. I'm going to repeat that. It's public. You 
can go now and get an account on a quantum computer, on a universal quantum computer. The problem is that when it first started, it only had five qubits. This was less than a year ago. At this moment, it has 17 qubits. In less than a year, it will probably be up to 50 qubits. And at 50 qubits, Google promised us last year that they were going to do a quantum supremacy experiment, which at 50 qubits would already prove that quantum computers were, were better than the classical computers that we have now, including supercomputers. That was a year ago. I haven't heard any public announcements yet. But what we need when we go forward with this is this common way forward. We need software to be able to talk to these quantum computers and to actually be able to use them for their maximum effect. And we also need to figure out what the hell we're doing with this entire surveillance debate. Because we have the tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater. My worst case scenario is where we have export control like we were thinking, you know, Vosinar, kind of the, the treaty to prevent us from exchanging information about pen testing tools, et cetera, that we would have the same kind of crazy behavior, export control over quantum computing or, you know, encryption again, that we go back to the crypto wars. So we really need to think about how we do this, but not forget how we always did it. We need to have more than one option. We need to be opportunistic. We need to think through defense in depth. So I encourage you, I ask you, it's a call to action, to just get started. You know, figure out what your strategy is for your company, for your data, for your customers' data. Start now. Thank you.